Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, people of the universe. This is Alex Crescioni, and in this episode of Home is Where the Dark Is, we have a very special guest. His name is Christopher Dahman of the band Dahman. Uh, he and I go way back. We played a show together back in 2011, um, and uh, we kept in touch, and we had a great conversation in this episode. Really excited for you guys to, to listen and tune in. Um, you know, Domin has been very influential for me as an artist, as an and as a musician in my career. And uh, they had they put out some great albums. They were on a uh, Roadrunner for a bit, and they did some amazing tours. And uh, I'm just I'm really glad to see that he's still creating music and still doing his thing. And I hope you guys enjoy this episode. So uh, please be sure to subscribe, be sure to share our episodes. You can uh, check out the online store I have in uh, the link below in the description. Uh, I have music on there. I have collectibles, incense, sage, and uh, all kinds of things that might be of interest to you. And uh, it's actually the same incense that we burn in uh, all the Home is Where the Dark is episodes, if you like to get your hands on some of that. Thank you so much for tuning in, and please welcome Christopher Dahman. Welcome, Christopher Dahman, to Home is Where the Dark is. Man, thank you so much for making the drive from the OC. And uh, it's been it's been quite a long time since I've seen you. And, it's uh, been we a have, while. Yeah, we have kind of a, a history going back. But first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming, and I appreciate your time. And yeah, I'm a big fan of your music, a big fan of, like, I've seen you, you know, go very far in your career, and I've seen your adjustments and the changes in the music. So... Uh, yeah, thank you, man. Thanks thank for you for by. having me here. Of course. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. It's good to reconnect. Absolutely. So, yeah, I kind of want to just go back to the beginning. You know, we, we played a show together uh, many years ago. I believe it was 2009. And it was at uh, Slide Bar. I think it was 2011. Was it? Okay, my memory is terrible. I thought I, thought <laughs> I was going to be the one that had the, the fuzzy memory. but Yeah. So, okay, 2011, Slide Bar. Which yeah, was... In Fullerton. In Fullerton, which was a fun show. Um, which is... I. Just moved from Fullerton like three, four months ago. I li- lived literally d- like right down the block from Slybar, which is no longer there. I know. I was just going to say they, they closed it. That yeah. was. Must have been was, a COVID casualty. Yeah, it was a COVID thing. Damn. I, li- I really like that place. It had, for the size of the room, it was like every time I went there, I was like, damn, they really had the sound dialed in. And it was, I think it was owned by the guy in. Lit. Lit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, that was a good times, man. I saw a lot of quite a few uh, shows there, but yeah, it was cool that we got to share the stage. That was one of my. That was probably my. That was my first gig, like with a new genre, playing a new genre of music than I was used to. Because before I got into that style, it was I was into like I was doing the extreme like technical death metal kind of stuff. But then oh, okay. I, I totally changed into to to try something new. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, you guys you guys played great that night, and um, that wasn't the first time. That wasn't the only time I would see you. I think the second time I saw you was at, fuck, what venue was it? It was on that hymn tour. Okay. It was the Wiltern. So that would have been before that. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was an a really great show. That was yeah. one of my, like, in terms of highlights and shows and touring and stuff, that was one of my favorite yeah, gigs. Yeah, it, it sounded amazing. And the huge audience, like, gorgeous venue. Um, I think it because it had been, like, I don't know, that would have, sort of near the end of, touring for about oh, over a year and so we were just like in a rhythm yeah and when when you're in that kind of groove um so we were doing well and then of course it was like a hometown show so i had uncles and cousins and my mom was in the audience and that kind of thing so, nice so it was kind of neat yeah so that was you said that was at the end of a year-long tour well it was because that would have been April 2010, I think. And um, we had been touring over a year at that point. Yeah. And that was um, all U.S.? Um, no. So it was because the hymn tour that we did then, that was after the leg of the hymn tour we did in the U.K. and Europe. Oh, okay. Because we, we were out with Lacuna Coil, and then we jumped on the hymn tour right after that, and that took us from January through 
April. Wow. So it was like four months at that point. Yeah. So you've had, I mean, you've had a lot of touring experience, a lot of live show experience. And like how you just said, you know, that gig was, you know, like the homecoming show. And it's like, I think there's something very special about, you know, cause I haven't played that many shows um, consecutively. Like I haven't toured. Um, I played shows back to back, but I haven't done like a year long tour or anything crazy mm -hmm. like that. But when you said you, you get into a groove, like as you kind of like, it's kind of like similar to, you know, working out. It's like when the first show is like, okay, I'm getting, you know, getting the dust and the cobwebs off. Like you're getting into the groove and it takes a few shows. Some bands are like quicker to get into it and some yeah. bands are slower. So what do you think the main thing is, you know, especially at, it's like the last show of a tour, it's your hum, homecoming show. It's because you, you've been playing consecutively like night after night. And it's just at that point, you're a well-oiled machine, just like grinding it out every night. But for you, what do you feel is the main, um, how does that feel like towards the end of a gig? Like when you've been performing so many nights, um, what do you notice? Like, what is the change that happens for you? Like over time on a tour? Um, I think it's just, you know, if you, if you, if you're playing the same songs, like which we were sort of, we would, you know, cause we were doing opening slots. So the longest we would be playing is 45 minutes. It's on average, it was around 30 minutes, which, you know, if you kind of break it down five minutes a song roughly, cause we'd always kind of do intros and outros and interludes and things like that to kind of be cohesive throughout the, throughout the set. Um, so you're talking like six songs. And um, after you play those six songs, I don't know, a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know, and you're, you may, you might switch out one or two, but, and then you're sort of learning the set. That's the other key thing too, is like when you start the tour, you go, this was a good opener, but energy kind of dropped this one, or it wasn't really the right time to lower the, lower the mood or yeah. whatever it is. So by the time you're doing it and you've got, you've got your set dialed in and it's just, you know, the set not only works for the audience, but it's also working for you. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the main things is like, that's sort of what helps you get in that groove is organizing your set, knowing what you're doing at each point in the song, between the songs and all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's, it's more of like, it must just be like a sense of comfort, a comfortability sense that you have right. when you're playing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So on that tour specifically, what were some highlights for you? Because I know um, we had talked before and messaging about you know, him and all that. But like, I know that was an amazing tour for you. So can you tell us a little bit about um, your memories of that tour and like some highlights, some, you know, strong moments? Um, I think for us, because we had been on several, you know, we were on several different tours by that time. The highlights for me were always um, the audience and the, um, you know, seeing people come back. Yeah. Like, oh, we saw you with the birthday massacre. We saw you with Wednesday Thirteen. We yeah. saw you with Comedy Christ. We, you know, and coming back. Oh, we just saw we saw you with Lacuna Coil. We had to come back and see you again. That kind of thing, I think, was sort of a. It always sort of stands out because you're you, you, you kind of have the validation being like, okay, we're doing something right. We've obviously we were we were good enough to where they saw us and they're coming back. Um, in terms of like specific moments. You know, it's it's sort of it's funny. It all becomes a blur sometimes. Um, you know, we for me like the most memorable things for me obviously was it was my first time touring Europe and the UK, and that's obviously even if you're just going there to visit, you know, all the places you see, the venues you play in, the history, all that kind of stuff. That was always the standout stuff for me. It's just you know you're used to being you know in your country where most people are speaking your language, and then all of a sudden you're in a place and you know, you can't read the signs and yeah. that kind of stuff. I just, for me, that sort of stepping out of your comfort zone stuff was neat. Gorgeous. And I, I would love to go back. Yeah. Like gorgeous architecture shifts as well. Cause yeah. compared to what we're used to here, you know, or even yeah. when you're like, you know, you're in Italy and it's a Roman road mm. and you're just like, this has been here for, you know, 1500 years, 2000 years. Yeah. And people are still on it. Yeah. You know, just that sort of sense of history. I always kind of, that's what I remember most because it was my first experiences with those things, you know, but, um, you know, in terms of, of playing like, you know, him, they were, they were great. Um, we were playing also with uh, a band called we are the fallen on that tour, which is all the Evanescence dudes minus 
Amy Lee. Mm -hmm. They had like a, what if it was American Idol singer filling in? Oh, really? Kind of thing. <laughs> um, and they were great. And, and some of the, you know, being on tour, that that's sort of what you remember too, is just the camaraderie. You know, I, I, I don't do well with like sitting and doing nothing. So I just always remember like helping the other bands load their gear, <laughs> you know, and just, you know, seeing like the hymns crew, their light guy, their sound guy, their, you know, their stage hands and stuff. And just, you, know, you make friends with, you know, not just the bands, but the crew too. And we, I, you know, we still were connected on Facebook to lots to some of their crew guys and stuff. Yeah. So, nice. So I think it's the relationships. That's what stands out the most. Absolutely. Yeah. It's cool to hear that because, you know, often, you know, you think like, oh, well, <laughs> um, it, it just, it just tells so much about a person when you say like, you know, you're the lead singer in, in the, one of the bands on the tour, but you, you know, during downtime, you're, you're thinking about others and helping others with their gear. It's like when you, you don't really have to do that, but just that shows a lot about your character. And it's like, I know I have friends that are like that too, but it's, it's also like, it's fucked up to see like two and, you know, I guess I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot of this too, like at, from touring and playing shows, just like when people have these extremely inflated egos and it's like, they're not really even, yeah. they're not, they're not anywhere near where they think they are, but they still act like that. And, um, that's always a disappointment. So it's cool to hear that, you know, just, you know, how, how humble you were in those situations. And, uh, yeah, I can relate to that because I'm the same way. Like I can't just sit still. If I see someone that needs help with something, I'd rather go help help you know help out yeah. instead of like being like oh well i'm not here to do that i'm just you know what i mean so i yeah i like that well i always have like this voice in my head that's just you know berating me all the time <laughs> don't be a lazy asshole you know help the, you know help out do something make yourself useful kind yeah of thing. so um so yeah so i yeah I, I just think you know and it's not you're burning calories anyway pick yeah. something up <laughs> yeah. yeah totally i like that attitude um so You've toured in the U.S. and in U.K., so I've I've heard stories from different people about their experiences. What are the vast differences? What for you? What have been the the, the differences between touring in the U.S. versus Europe? Like how, um, everything, I guess. Like the the stage, like how you're. I think I guess what I'm mainly trying to get at is like the treatment, because I've heard stories about like, oh, they treat you so much better in, in Europe because you know they in in, in the U.S. they're like kind of like get it, get you in and get you out kind of treatment mm -hmm. in Europe. It's more like they, they're grateful that you're there and their city and their country and they're honoring you and they're, you know, you get more, you know, more of a, a writer or you get more, you know, just like, it seems like they, they're more grateful for you for music. Um, but that's what I've heard, but I haven't experienced that. What has been your experience? Um, if I'm trying to remember, um, you know, I've, I've been equally as impressed by places in the States than I was as I was anywhere overseas, really. Um, you know, like I remember, it's funny, I remember specifically there was a couple, there was a venue, I think it was in Philadelphia that we played. And I remember the the people there were being amazing in terms of like, you know, we didn't, we had like a rider, but most of the time it never got filled because we were just the support band. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, here, you get this, you know, <laughs> you get the crumbs off the, you know, the headliner. Um, but I remember, you know, there was a venue was like, oh, you know, we're going to go get you like, what do you want? We'll go get you whatever you want from the grocery store or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just, it just depends on the venue. Depends on the staff. House of Blues venues have always been notoriously awesome backstage because you're also, you, they also have the menu from the restaurant. So those kinds of, you know, they, they're, they're known for being really good. Um, but yeah, I don't, there's nothing that really stands out to me in terms of venues in the UK or Europe where I was like, oh, we're getting better treatment than anywhere else. I think sometimes it just depends on the venue and, and where you're at. Like there's been, I remember there was a time we were playing in, it was somewhere in Oklahoma, Tulsa or Oklahoma City. And, you know, generally everybody just seemed really appreciative that we were playing their town, you know? And I think just, you know, it's not uncommon where you play in New York and LA and you see a lot of this. <laughs> right. Arms crossed, right. you know, right. <laughs> who, right. who are these, you know? Yahoo's or whatever, but, um, yeah, I just think sometimes it's just the specific, the specific venue and maybe the specific city that has maybe a more of an appreciation than other places. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I want to kind of shift gears a little bit here and, um, 
I just want to talk about your your sound. I mean, you you have a very unique sound, and、um, do you do you consider it like a certain genre, or do you are you the type of person to not really put yourself in a category, or like when you describe your sound to somebody, like how would you describe it? It always it's always a funny thing when you get into genres and things like that. And so generally, if someone asks me, and I don't know their anything about their background or anything. I don't know their point of reference.、Mm -hmm. um, I just say it's, it's rock music, it's rock and roll. Like that's kind of what I. That's sort of like my blanket, you know. Because there's so many like little, little things you can get into, and we've been called so many different things.、Um, and without knowing the point of reference that they have, it's hard. You know, it's it's funny. Like I, you could tell there's like, like we've had someone come to a show and be like, you know who you sound like? Metallica. <laughs> wow. And I'll go like, really? Wow. But you know, there but. <laughs> That might be the only reference they have to a rock band, right? Because maybe everything else in the house is like Motown or something, right? You know what I mean? So we're rock guitars, and so that kind of thing, you know.、Yeah. So if you don't know the point of reference, you don't really know how to describe it to people. But I, or I used to just say dark rock. So it's rock, but it's a bit moody. Yeah, and you know, there's some keyboards in it, that kind of thing. And I, I, I try to just be very basic in general. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I like that because I, I think, I don't know from my experience with like. You know, I was talking with different musicians and you know people I worked with in the studio. It's like, you know, so sometimes that's a very touchy thing because, you know, as we perform and we put our music out in the world over time throughout the years, we get all kinds of feedback. So, you know, sometimes, you know, we we try to. Some people try harder to control how, you know, their music is perceived. But there's something that happens once you push it, once you put it out in the market, like it just turns into whatever the market wants it to be. If that makes、yeah. sense. So、yeah. you know you could try as hard as you want to be a certain genre, which a lot of people do. Like they they try to pigeonhole themselves into the specific genre of metal or whatever, and、um, sometimes it works. But oftentimes, like it's kind of like what you said. It's you know people will hear it in a completely different light, or, or they'll they'll see it in a different light. And you know, more people will consider you something else, which can be frustrating for musicians.、Mm. And I've I've been through that as well. But I think I like how you said you, you know, you try not to be too niche with it. You know, just keep it、yeah. keep it broad. Because yeah, when I listen to your music, it's it's definitely rock. There's no doubt about that. But、right. you can't say it's like, oh, it's goth rock or it's you know whatever. It's like definitely rock. So I like that you you aren't saying. It's this specific niche thing.、So、yeah, it's funny because for me, it's it's almost the opposite when you're saying how people try to fit themselves in a niche. Whereas with me, I always have a, I don't know if it's a rebellious streak or 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 what it is, but I always feel like any moment that I feel like I'm put into a cage, I want to break out of it and be like, no, 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 I can also <laughs>、yeah. do this. Right. You know. Right. I can do that.、Right. Like, don't try to put me into anything. So,、um, yeah, I always try to. Push against having rules and boundaries because yeah, it's just it's very restrictive, right? And like we've been called goth rock, I've referred to ourselves as goth rock, but then I'll see some other band that's definitely goth rock, and I go, oh, we're not quite like that, so maybe we're not goth rock. So that's yeah, yeah I don't know, I don't know what to call us, rock and roll. <laughs> you know? Hell yeah! So you have. A new record that came. I'm sorry. Did it came out in 2022 or 2023? The the dominant Oz tones. 2022. 2022. So tell us a little bit about this、um, shift in your musical path. As it, are you transitioning into this new name and this new group?、Uh, are you leaving just the dominant title behind and you're moving on to this new thing? Or can tell us a little bit about that. So, where do I begin?、Um, I've always been trying to figure out what I should be doing,、um, and so Domin, you know, is a specific thing, you know, dark rock, goth rock kind of thing.、Um, when we were about to do our second record, I started writing a bunch of stuff that was not in that vein. It just sort of came out, and it was very much like. There were rockabilly influences. There were blues influences. There was even like some country, like old school country、mm -hmm. influences, and I didn't know what to do with it. And so, it's funny. I remember sending some of that stuff to Roadrunner at the time, and 
looking back on it now, they were probably just like, what the hell is this? Like, why are you sending us this? You know, hmm. we're waiting, yeah. we're waiting for love is gone too. Right. But you know, more commercial okay, you know, is what they're kind of had in mind. And, um, and so I always just had these songs. I didn't know really what to do with them. So I ended up putting out another, you know, a second Domin record and then a third Domin record. And then I ended up moving to Australia and I saw it sort of as an opportunity because I remember going to this bar and in Brisbane, Australia, which is where I moved. And I saw this like rockabilly band performing on stage. And I remember th- seeing them and going, and they had like a, a female singer and you know, drummer, upright bass player, guitar player. And I was like, I could be doing this other thing over here. You know what I mean? Because Dahlman has somewhat of a presence in Australia, but not really. We did one big festival there back in 2011 and made some fans there, but prim- but nobody knows Dahlman over there. So I was like, oh, I could do something different over here. Yeah. Um, and so while I was there, and so I saw this band playing, I was like, oh, if I could just get this band, but I could sing for them, and, you know, it would be awesome. So I, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up hitting up the bass player and and the guitar player and they joined my thing. We got a different drummer. Um, but it was more of like, it's not, it wasn't anything like a, well, now I'm going to do this thing. I'm leaving this behind. It was more of just, I'm over here. My, my Dom and bands in the U S we're not doing anything at the moment. Well, let me, let me make a record with these guys. Gotcha. So it was just playing with them and sort of it's, it's a project that it, that exists on as its own thing, but, um, it doesn't, it's not like in place of, Domin or anything else. Gotcha. So it was just like, yeah, it was a fun opportunity to to work with some awesome musicians and um, put out some music that's been laying around for a while. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's to go back to what you said about the Roadrunner thing. Like, I think that kind of what you said earlier too about not wanting to be like uh, pigeonholed into a genre, and you know how you said, well, yeah, Roadrunner is expecting a certain sound, but I'm really I'm really feeling this other sound and I'm trying to, you know, I have these ideas that I need to get out of my system, but I can't do it with this project. So I think like your intuition was telling you like, okay, well I need to kind of have a side project or or a separate project where I can get out that creative, those creative juices. So yeah, when I listened to that, um, like immediately, like when you said rockabilly, like that's immediately what came to my, to my mind. Also like you have a very cool, like, um, and I hope this doesn't offend you, but I, I hear like that, that Elvis, yeah. you know what I mean? And like immediately. And I think it's so cool how you're, it's like a modern twist on that with rock. And it's just, it's sound, like I said, I was telling you before, like the production on um, that new record sounds great. And I really like how you brought that kind of like classic old school sound with a modern twist. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I really like that. And um, yeah, so so you're not leaving Domin behind. It's just something separate. So yeah, it's yeah. just a separate thing. And like, you know, I have songs that I that I make that are more in that style, and so my hope is that I do another record with them that's in that style. But at the same time, I'm, you know, almost at the end of making a new Domin record. So nice. So know. are you still in contract with Roadrunner? Or are you no. doing independent? No, we got dropped back in 2011 or 2012. It must have been. I don't remember. It's sort of blurring together, but somewhere around end of 2011. Yeah. Or early 2012 is when. Our relationship with them ended and, you know, their, their whole label went, I'm not sure how familiar you are, but you know, their whole label went, you know, got upended and restructured and lots of bands got dropped and lots of people got fired and laid Mm. off. And, um, you know, we were in that whole mess. Yeah. So are you like looking back on it? So independent now. Yeah. It's totally independent. Looking back on it though, are you, um, are you happy about the relationship and the time you did have with Roadrunner, like it, did it did it bring you the opportunities that you hoped it would? Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, I you have to, I have to be grateful for what I did get out of it. Yeah. You know, I I, I clearly wish it would have continued. Um. Well, you know, hindsight, who knows? I I don't know where it would have ended up, or if it would have been a good a good thing or a bad thing, but. You know, obviously we were like so excited to do the next album and we were gearing up and meeting with producers and going on songwriting sessions and just doing the whole thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, the the end of it sort of, you know, put a bad taste in my mouth because I felt like I was being screwed with the whole mm. time. Um, 
because it was sort of just like just dragged on and on and on and getting reassurance that no everything's cool you know make your album and then like sending in the songs and just not hearing back and nobody wow. answering emails and so and like just being you know i remember nearing the end of it talking to the head and guy over there because the r and r guy got laid off and so dealing with something someone new and just going like just tell me if you're gonna let me go just yeah. like let me know because i'm sitting here in limbo not knowing like whether we're making a record or they're we have a label and I think at the time they were probably just going through meetings and trying to figure out themselves. Yeah. Um, not just us, but who knows who else and staff and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so I, for, for a little bit, I had like a bitter taste in my mouth from it, but at, you know, looking back on it now, I'm just like, well, yeah, I'm super grateful, like super thankful because if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have gone on tour. We wouldn't have gotten, you know, played with all the bands we played with. We wouldn't have, any of the fan base that we have now, you know, so I think you just have to be, you know, count, always count your blessings all the time. Sure. Absolutely. So yeah, it did, it did open up a lot of doors for you, um, oh, yeah. you know, being on the label and maybe you could, uh, you know, cause I'm always curious about this too. And I know it, it's different with different labels and, um, different booking agencies and whatnot, but did Roan Rudder, like, did they help you get on these tours? Cause I know some, sometimes the labels, they don't help you get on tours. You have to have a separate booking for that. And they are the ones that like, if you have like, um, an agent or a booking agent that they'll push you out on tours and they'll help you get those gigs and the festivals and whatnot. And sometimes the labels are inter intermingled with the booking and they, they have like a, they work together. But from, from your experience, was it the label like pushing you, um, the label pushing you to booking agencies and helping you get on these tours and festivals? Um, it was both depending on the tour. So, yeah. you know, we, we had, you know, Roadrunner was our label. We had, um, Nick Storch. Um, I don't know who he's with now, but he was our booking agent. Um, so you have your booking agent, you have your manager, you have your, your label. And, you know, a lot of times the agent would say, you know, Hey, I submitted you for this tour and they're all cool with it and and great and you're off to the races and the label's just like okay green light you know we'll mm -hmm. make sure that we've got you know you got tour support and that kind of stuff um but for like example with the hymn tour that was like an all hands on deck thing because so many people wanted that opening I slot bet, yeah. like we like so many bands that even in our little circle because we were you know obviously playing with a lot of similar bands to us were like going for that and wanted that yeah and i think the only reason we got it was because you know the label came and said, "Hey, we'll make sure that we'll we'll basically give the tour X amount of marketing dollars." Mm. You know, so it was the agent, it was our manager, it was and our manager was Rick Sales, who managed Slayer and Mastodon and all that. So we had some very powerful people behind the band, and so with all that mixed together, then of course we were able to get that tour. But I think you know. I th I think a large part of that was Roadrunner saying we'll commit, you know, a certain amount of money to not necessarily like buying you on a tour, but right. saying like we'll make sure that there's advertising for I mean, these markets or whatever it is. So yeah, they were they were an important element for that. A lot of moving parts. Yeah. a lot more that goes into these tours and these festivals than than most people think. And sometimes it's sometimes it's a lot of moving parts like that, and sometimes it's just a direct connection. It just depends on oh, the yeah. situation, right? So like, how do you th feel about that, that too? I mean, I know I'm positive you, you haven't done this, but what about bands that I've always had a very bitter taste in my mouth about bands that choose to like buy on tours? Cause it's like, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I, I won't say who, but like we've been on tours where there were other bands that were bought on mm. and, um, you know, I, it's, one person could argue, like, maybe maybe there's really no difference between Roadrunner saying, we'll put marketing dollars in, and the other, you know, this manager for another band going, like, here's $100,000. Right. Or whatever it is. Right. Like, you can argue that there's no difference. Um, but, you know, money can buy a lot of things. Yep. Yeah. You know, and, you know, I guess for some people, it gets them on tours, and, you know, it, it's it seems a little unfair, but... Life's not fair. Sure, so. especially the music industry. <laughs> uh, if you want, you know, if you want fair, don't don't be in the music industry. No, and it, and, <laughs> and like you know, a lot is a lot of it is relationships, and a yeah. lot of it's who you know. Like, I mean, I remember starting out in a band, and like I can't you know, it's back in the day before 
you know, really email and, you know, there was email, but it wasn't like it is now and social media. And like, I remember sending demos and stuff to labels, like the old school way, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just like, and trying to meet so-and-so who works in the mail room, you know, just that, all that old stuff of just like trying to get connections. And I didn't know anybody in the industry. I didn't know a soul. And I remember hearing one time, I can't remember where this came from, but you know, like I'm, I'm originally from San Dimas. Okay. That's where I grew up, which is, you know, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure <laughs> land. Um, but that's, it's like, you know, 25 minutes east of downtown LA. And I remember someone saying like, yeah, you know, and, and it used to be a big deal if you could get like a label guy to come out and watch your band play, you know, like invite a guy from Interscope to come out, see the band playing at whatever club. And uh, I remember someone saying, yeah, no one's going anywhere east of the 605. <laughs> They're just not going to go out there. Yeah. So you better come out here and play. And I, and it sort of that always sort of stuck with me. So you know, back in the day when I was in other bands, we'd always be playing like the Whiskey and the Roxy and the Troubadour and places like that. And um, I remember getting really frustrated at, at one time, and I saw an audition for a guitar position in another band that was out like in Woodland Hills. And I was like, oh, I'll do that. You know, let's. I I got to put you know throw as many darts as I can at the wall to see if something sticks. And I remember playing with them and it was like a, like a new band that had not been around, done anything, like just jamming up in their parents' loft kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And within like three months, they had the president of so-and-so label company coming out to watch them. And I was like, whoa, how does that happen? Yeah. Cause, cause they're all connected. Okay. Yeah. Cause if you knew the right person, you could, make it happen yeah it's true it's like if someone in someone in your family like works at a label or knows like someone that works at a label or is in the industry themselves it's like yeah it's 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 just about like your close connections if someone can help you get there faster i mean that happens all the time so yeah i mean in uh, some ways it's completely natural and in some ways if if you're not that person with that connection it seems very unfair yeah yeah it is yeah and i but i i truly think i mean you're right it isn't fair i mean if anything isn't fair in the world, that's definitely the the music industry is like yeah. on that list, a top top ten list. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I, I think um, you know people like you and I who have you know, it's our it's our passion, you know, and, and we'll we'll do whatever we need to do to to make our dreams come true or to make you know to make these things happen that we want to make happen. Um, you know, we we just do whatever needs to be done, and we don't. Yeah, sh- I'm sure we've we've had plenty of things happen that aren't fair, but you just keep moving yeah. forward and you don't you don't bitch about it. And they're like, well, this how did they got that opportunity so so quickly? And I've been working my whole life like shit like that. It's like it's, I mean, yeah, it's just gonna happen, you know. Welcome but, to life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you know, yeah. and about buy ons, it's like, yeah, there's a there's bands I've seen plenty of bands buy on tours mm-hmm. that I would have loved to be on or would have loved to, whatever. But the thing is, is yeah, maybe maybe you can buy on a tour, but the industry will eat you up super quick if you're not ready. You know, if you're not oh, yeah. like if you get onto a tour, but you you don't fit on the tour, you're just you're not great. You're not great yet. I mean, yeah, you'll you'll do that tour, but you probably won't do another one again unless no. you're like you really step up your game and you really improve and you're really killing it. Um, that's I've seen that happen too. It's like ooh, you, it's like it's just cringe. Yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah. If if you're not you know, it, it's a bad investment if you're going to spend all that money and you're not really ready. Right. And it, it's just, it's fucked up because, you know, it's the music business. So yeah, if they have, if they're, they're waving around that, that money to, to get on the tour and, you know, they're accepted on the tour, but maybe they have no, no place really being there or, you know, um, an agency or a, a label or a festival will, um, they'll approve that band, uh, be some but then it'll ready. be just like super embarrassing, you know what I mean? When they get up there and it's just like, they're super green and just not ready. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's it happen all the time. But anyway, so you have this new side project and you have a new Dom record that's done. You're just, are you, so you're waiting on, are you waiting on like a, a label opportunity? Or are you waiting on, um, are you going to self-release it or what's, um, well, it's not, it's not fully done yet. So I'm at the, I'm like doing the last song on guitar and then I got to do all the vocals. And okay, cool. Mixing and mastering and then, okay. um, and then I'll have to figure out, you know, do photo shoots and make a video of videos and yeah. do all that kind of stuff. And, 
Um, I'm hoping to have it released this year, probably near the end of the year or yeah. maybe fall. Um, I've put out an album on the summer solstice, winter solstice, so I might do fall, first nice. day of fall or something. That'd be cool. Um, but yeah, so I'm hoping to have it out, but I would love to, you know, you know, I don't even, it's funny because the sort of incentives of working with a label have changed over the years. Um, there's some things that labels can do for you for sure. And there's some things that they aren't going to be any better at doing than yourself. Right. Um, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to working with a label. I, I know one thing for sure. I don't think I'd ever give up my rights again. Um, I would do, if, if anything, I would do some sort of, you know, license the album out for X number of years kind of thing, or yeah. you have exclusive rights to, to the record for that. But at some point, the rights go back to me. Smart, yeah. Um, but if not, you know, if, if I'll, I'll definitely kind of put some feelers out there, but I'm not going to try too hard. Uh, for me, where I'm at now, I'm just about writing songs, recording music, and putting it out. Same, man. And if I anybody is wants to come along with the ride and 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 be a part of it, then I'm happy. And if not, I'm just going to do it anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, you know. Are you planning on? Are you hoping to? get the band back together and after this record is ready and is out, are you hoping to, to play shows and tour on it? Or are you just kind of playing that by ear? I don't know. Um, you know, as it is now, like uh, it's Dom is a solo project. It's just me. Um, you know, Bill, the bass player, he kind of parted ways back in like right after, well, before the third album came out, because I was in Australia and I basically recorded the whole thing while I was there um, and had Cameron, the drummer, send me tracks and I mixed it all um, and just did it like that. But so Bill left before that album even came out, but he came back for like photos and stuff because we were like, I've known the guy since I was in third grade. Like we're just buddies. And um, but by the, by the time all that stuff was happening, you know, it's like well, the band's not doing as much as we used to like. You know, we've been off tour for so long. I've had to find work. I've had to get a job. I've had to, you know, just all the other things that come with life. When yeah. you're when you're not sort of full blown doing the band full time, full yeah. throttle, there's just other things in life that happens. Right. Know? Yeah. And I think it's that's a good point to bring up is, you know, if you're really going going for it hard and you're 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 signed or you're not signed, but you're you're playing a lot of shows, you're touring, you're able to like make a decent living off of music it's like you have you can't stop because once yeah. you stop then the money stops and then you're then you have to you know join the join society and you know get a normal job just to to pay your bills right like yeah. everyone needs to pay their bills so that's a good point it's like once you if you can get into that um routine and you are able to um make a full-time living from music and for either from touring or because no one's buying records anymore so um if you're able to do that year after year for a while, um, then that's great. But yeah, like you said, it's if you slow down, then you know at some point you're gonna have to get a different job or do something else in music to sustain yourself. So how do you? So that's yeah. yeah. So that's basically you know everybody that that was in the band had to go on and do other things. Yeah. And yeah. now it's just me. And so and you know I'm not. I mean, fortunately, like no one's having to make their living off the music anymore. You know what I mean? It's just it's more of a a passion project at yeah. this point. And so I would like to tour again. Um, if not, you know, like that's the other thing I've sort of over the years, kind of just watching different people do it. There's no one way to do things. And so I know there's like the typical way of like, Oh, you're going to go out for six weeks or you're going to eight weeks or whatever and do yeah. a tour. But there's also people that, you know, are the weekend warriors and, 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 and not small bands. Like they're, big artists that go out and go, you know, they'll do a run up California, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. And then three weeks later they'll do somewhere on the East coast. And so I can see myself doing that. I don't know if I'd see myself on a full blown tour unless I got an opportunity offered to me, mm -hmm. you know, where all oh, you get to open for this, you know, obviously like I wouldn't be able to afford to just fund myself to be on the road. Right. The whole time. Yeah. That's it's expensive. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of, you know, up and coming bands or like just people in general that realize, you know, you know, just because you're on tour and yeah, you're, you're making money, but 
that sometimes. doesn't sometimes, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you're able to like, you still have, you still have to send money home. Right. Cause if you don't, you're, you're paying rent at home, you're paying your bills at home while you're gone. And if you have yeah. a family, it's even more. Yeah. So, and so pretty much, unless you're like in one of these top tier acts, if you're like a Metallica and you're making so much fucking money on tour or even off tour, like you don't have to worry about that shit. But when you're, you know, like the, the average band that's touring or doing festivals, you know, every dollar counts because yeah, all that money you make, you're sending home, right? Unless you're doing really well, then yeah, maybe you can put some aside, but and then you have your expenses on the road, which fluctuate and it's just, it could be a nightmare. So oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated. It's expensive, you know, and like, I think even Metallica is two weeks on, two weeks off. I think that was sort of something that worked out for themselves. And it's yeah. like, that's great. I mean, it's very expensive because obviously they're paying the salaries of all their crew on the two weeks off, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. So it gets expensive, but yeah, I, I, I would hope there's, I hope I can find a path to do it. Um, I've even sort of toyed with the idea of possibly trying to find backing bands in certain locations. Um, like I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to find, you know, a drummer, bass player, late bass player and keyboard player in the UK. Yeah. So I could fly idea. in and be like, let's do a run of shows, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, or something on each coast of the, of the U S or some, you know, some sort of thing. I, I've, I've got my eye out and I got my ear to the ground to find a situation like that. I'm not holding my breath, but it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you can try to create the perfect scenario, but you could also wait forever and it never happened. Right. So right. knowing that I only have control over me, and what I can do that, that, you know, in the meantime, I'm just like, all right, well, I'm going to record music, write music, record music, put it out, write music, record music, put it out. And I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea of touring or anything, but I'm not going to wait for that to happen. When you know, after you put out this record and I think the right opportunities will present themselves. And uh, yeah, it's like, you know, I think also like as, as we get older, I think our priorities shift and in, in like very strong ways, at least for oh, me. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if you have, you have a family or you're married and you know, you're, you're getting, you know, middle midlife, it's like, okay, I, I toured or I did all that stuff. Um, and that, that passion is still there. And, um, but at the same time, it has to really be worth it to be able to take that time away. Like, not yeah. all, like, you know, because it's like, you know, being away from your, your family or your, um, your spouse, um, and if you have a day job, you're sacrificing that income. So it really has to be worth it. So that too. Yeah. And you know, like when I was touring heavily, it was literally, I'm in a different place now. I'm not going to be doing the, you know, sleeping on a fan's floor right. to make right. it to the next gig anymore. I'm right. not, you know, I'm not going to do that. So, um, you know, it's different if you're, you know, 18, 19 and you're with a bunch of dudes and it's just your bros hanging out yeah. and you're crashing in wherever and stuff. And it's just like, yeah, you know. I'm not gonna be doing that. I'd rather, you yeah. know, I, I don't, I don't know what arrangement I could figure out, but you know, that's that's probably not gonna be my situation. I, it gets a little sad after a while if you're, you know. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, I I haven't even done a crazy tour, but just the idea of okay, if if I got asked to do a tour this year, but it's like a van tour where you're like going across the states and you're like maybe getting shitty hotels, like no. Nah. I, I, there's yeah. no, zero interest in that. And it's yeah. like, I'd rather just stay here and make music and do my thing. I mean, know? that's the other thing too, is like after having toured and being off tour, I sort of, you know, it's, it, it's, it, anybody will tell you from the, the biggest rock stars to the, to the people that start out, there's so much dead time. Mm. And you're, you're basically living for like the 30 minutes to the hour you play on stage. Yeah. And it's just like, time is the most precious thing that you've got. Do you really want to spend it in the middle of nowhere? Like some people would say, oh, it's worth it. You know, when you get to, when you get to the gig, it's worth it to play the show. And like on some level I can see that, but also like having, you know, lived the life that I've lived and in, in my situation now, I go like, yeah, I don't know if I want to spend 15 hours in the middle of Canada. Yeah. Like what could I else, what could I be doing with that time? You know? So yeah, it's, it's your priority shift, you know, majorly. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Yeah. It's, it's great to hear that you have, you know, new music that's going to be released and cause you know, when, when was the last, the last Dom record was what year? Well, the full record was in 2016. 
Okay. And wow. then when I was in Australia, I put out five singles. Like I think I put out like two or three in 2018 and a couple in 2019. Um, and those songs will end up being on the record. Gotcha. Cool. I think when you put out singles for me anyway, like it feels like they're never, it's, they're never done. Like yeah. once they put yeah, it, yeah, once yeah. they're on an album, I feel yeah. like, yeah, they're complete because they're that. with like a, like there's a consistent drum sound along all of them. And they're sort of like a, a theme or whatever yeah. it is. Like once they're on an album, they feel done. If I just put out singles, I just feel like, you know, I they, totally feel they're, you there. They're, they're yeah. unfinished. Yeah. So. And I, I, I'm kind of in between that because I, in 2024, like I see how it's beneficial to do singles and like a single with a video. I think that's cool. But I, I do like when bands choose to put those, maybe they put like three or four singles out in a year. And then the next year they put those on a record with like six other songs, but then they remix them so that mm -hmm. it, they're all, um, they're all, it's like, you know, they all have the same drum tones, like you said. So it's all, it's all fits in, but then those singles, um, that are still up on Spotify or whatever have a slightly different mix, which yeah. I, doesn't bother me. Uh, I kind of like when, I kind of like when on records, um, each song is slightly different. Uh, sometimes I like, it just depends on the, the music, I guess, but I do like records when the mixes are all generally the same, like the same drum tone, same vocal, but there are slight differences throughout the songs, which mm -hmm. is cool. I also like when each song is mixed completely differently. Um, that can be cool as well. So it just depends on, uh, on the music for me, but I, I, I understand what you're saying when you say like, it's, it feels finished when it's on a full length. So yeah. I totally get that. I don't know why yeah. that is. Cause it's, it's like I was, we were talking about earlier how there's always like the wisdom of the industry or like, this is how you should be doing things now. And I remember when I moved, that was one of the things that was in my head. Oh, you gotta be releasing singles, <laughs> new single every week or every yeah. month or yeah. whatever it is, what some, some kind of thing. And so I was like, okay, let me try that. Let me see if, it, you know, because it was always about, it's like with social media or something. Like Spotify has its algorithms. If if you, if they see your constant release in music, you're more likely to get on playlists, you know. Yeah. So you try to play along with these games and stuff. So I did that, and I was just for those five songs, and I was like, yeah, I don't know. It just feels like they're sort of just dangling out there, and there's not really the same awareness to the singles. They mm -hmm. sort of just feel a bit like I understand it from like a marketing perspective. You're, you're single in your video, and I get that. Yeah. Um, from more of I don't know artistic perspective. Or just, I don't know. I mean, I, I always pay attention to, to new songs coming out, what bands are doing, and, and like I'll listen to Apple's new music releases every week. You know, I, I, I use Apple instead of Spotify, but, you know, I'm always listening to like whatever's happening, and, and there's always new singles and best new songs and stuff, but I don't know. I always find the album to be like the finished thing. It's very, it's still very satisfying to me. Like I like when I like sitting down and listening to old records. Still, I know most, me too. You know, Gen Z people don't even know, like, haven't probably listened to a full record in their existence, which I, I get. It's a, it's not a, you know, a modern, uh, it's not a modern activity, I guess, to listen yeah. to a whole record all the way through. But I mean, I still love doing that. And I like, you know, putting on a vinyl here, and, you know, from time to time, and just sit, sitting down and, you know, at home doing whatever, just listening. All yeah. the way through, I still love that. Um, it could be my age, like I don't know. Maybe that's why I still love albums, but I don't know. There's something, something final that that's, and and I think it has something to do with creating a vibe. Yeah, like it's yeah. It's, it's its own artistic thing. You know, or, oh, yeah. organizing song orders and definitely you know, interludes between songs and how you end it and how you begin it and just all that kind of stuff. It just feels a bit more complete than the song sort of just out there on its own for me, anyway. No, I completely agree. It leaves more of a, it leaves more of an impact. It leaves more of a, a legacy instead of just having, yeah, like, you know, say you, you put out a single every month for a year and then you have like 12 singles up on whatever. And then yeah. that or a full packaged album, like it just, it feels so much more satisfying to me. But having said that, I don't, I don't have anything against singles. It's just, you know, I, I can, I can relate with, with you there. Well, yeah. Well, when I was, you know, part of when I, I was putting out some stuff under Christopher Dahman instead of Dahman as well. And, you know, just a few singles here and there. And, and so, yeah, I, I sort of got it and I understood it. But even when I put those out, it just didn't feel complete. So all the stuff that's under my solo thing, under Christopher Dahman, I'm taking those down. I'm going to re-record them, put them out as Dahman songs. And nice. Hell yeah. Yeah. So we'll see how we go. Awesome. So, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about, you know, you've, you've seen the, the major shifts in the industry from the way we consume music, you know, from, 
from listening on tapes to CDs. Now it's with the internet. Like, how do you feel about um, the world of Spotify and all that? Like, are you have you come to terms with it, or are you are you not not crazy about it? Um, like, how do you feel about this new world of the way we consume music? I mean, I feel fine with it. I'm I'm part of it. You know, I listen to I've I've got my Apple Music. I'm, you know, like I've got a CD collection, but I don't listen to them anymore. Even though I still feel like it's almost like the CD now almost feels like a merch item. Mm, yeah. Is in a lot of ways like a lot of people how they collect vinyl now. Like I don't know how many people are actually playing vinyl I know, right? or just yeah. buying the vinyl. Yeah. Um, CDs sort of feel like that to me. Like this next Domin record, I'll probably have it on CD um, because there are fans that want that physical copy. And I think in some ways it is good to have that physical copy because the one thing about, you know, Spotify or Apple or wherever you listen to it, you don't own that music. Right. And so for whatever reason, like, you know, I mean, even myself, right. I've, I've got singles out, they're coming down, I'm taking them down. And so there may be people who like, were like, I liked that one. I liked that song. Or I liked yeah. that version or I liked that recording better. And it's like, should have downloaded it. <laughs> should, have, should have downloaded yeah. it, yeah. Or, uh, but you know, if you have a, a physical version, you've, it's you've got it. It's yours. You know. It's a good point. I don't think um, a lot of people like think about that because you're paying like your monthly, yeah. ten bucks for Spotify or whatever. I use Title. I just I like Titles. Um, to me, it sounds better. Does the, it really? The fidelity. Um, I'm really like super anal about that stuff. But I just prefer like the. Um, the user interface of title it's a mm. bit more smooth for me um just spotify and, and i'm not honestly i'm not really happy with um everything that's going on with spotify and and the rates that they're they're paying to artists like the fractions of a penny like it's all like it just seems really disgusting to me um that, that's just my <laughs> opinion yeah. um but you know it, there's nothing we could do about it you know it's just that's the you know that's the way the industry is right now but having said that i do feel like it's it's nice to have a CD. It's nice to be able to purchase, you know, if if you're a streamer, but you want to actually own the song, you could still go to iTunes, the iTunes store, download the same shit that yeah. you're streaming. But I don't, I don't, a lot of people don't do that anymore. Um, I still do that. But yeah, I still buy CDs. I still buy vinyls. I do prefer listening to the CD because I hear the, it's an extreme difference in quality compared to streaming off mm -hmm. Spotify from your Bluetooth in your car or whatever. Uh, I hear that, but yeah. I know the average listener might not care or might not even hear that. So I get how convenient it is and it, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. <clears throat> um, but yeah, I do think, I do think there are still a lot of people that uh, hold value in a physical copy of music. Yeah. Also too, like, you know, when I, I moved back from Australia to here and because it was different countries, I had to like refine everything in my library again. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like when I came here, I couldn't, my Apple music library was gone because huh. I had to sign up under a different account from a different country. Like if you're visiting, it's fine. But if you're like setting up an account in that country, you can't just transfer your library or anything. Interesting. So I had to like, what I ended up doing is like, and I knew it was going to happen. So I took screenshots of my library so I can go back in and try to find everything over yeah. again. And, get my library back. So that's it. It's the one thing is like, if you stop paying for your service, it's all gone. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. so that's, and you know, that's one of the benefits of having the CD and I, I, I haven't even seen CD players anymore. So I don't even, <laughs> like, I can't remember the last time I've seen like a CD player. Right. Yeah. Like the last time you went into Best Buy, I don't, I don't even, I assume they still have like boom boxes with CD players or stereo I don't systems. Know. That's a good point. I, I know you could like, I know people can, um, you could put a CD in your your Xbox or your oh, yeah. Blu-ray player systems. or whatever. Um, and it'll play that way. But yeah, um, it's a good point because yeah, most computers don't have CD-ROMs anymore. No. Like cars don't have CD players. So it's so weird. It's all Bluetooth and streaming. So yeah, that's the reality. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still sensitive for me. But I understand it's like you you have to you know evolve or die, right? So yeah, you have to go <laughs> where the people are, really. What's that? You have to go where the people are. Right. You know, right. If that's if you, if that if everyone's on Spotify, put your music on Spotify. I mean, it does suck. The payments suck, but I, I think that's still something that's getting figured out. I think there's always slight changes and they're trying to figure out a way to do it. I heard there's some new thing where they're getting rid of all the, like, um, 
what do you call it, like sleep music or whatever it is that people put up. Like, I guess there's like thousands and thousands of songs that are like background noise. Really? Yeah. And huh. they're, they're basically making it so that those things no longer can monetize. Mm, interesting. Which would make the pie a bit bigger for like your actual artist putting out songs. But still, you know, the way that it's weighted, like I don't know, I'm sure you're familiar with how how it's weighted where, you know, the the biggest artist gets the, it's not really like, if someone streams the song, you're not getting that stream. Yeah. You know, if someone down, like it's, you're not getting that specific stream or if somebody has a subscription and they let, let's say they only listen to your band all month and they paid like a $10 subscription. That doesn't mean you're getting that. $10. Of course. Of you course. Know, which, right. But it would be good if, if, it, if that was the case. It should be that way. But yeah, it, it's true. It's just, and they also, they started a new thing where there's this press release about it. Um, apparently like if you don't, if you're, Music doesn't hit a thousand streams. Oh, right. You get zero no matter what, which sucks. But I guess, like, I mean, you, you want to bring up your numbers. Like, obviously, that's it's a great goal to be above a thousand at least. Um, but for someone starting out, it's for not someone starting out, it's it's difficult, you know. Um, but yeah, hopefully that will be resolved in the coming years. So it just needs to be, it just needs to be a bit more evened out and. Um, yeah, the it, the reality is, if if it wasn't for the artists, there would be no Spotify. So I think you know, the artists should be paid uh, a bit more fairly. And um, yeah, like I saw some Snoop Dogg video where he was like saying he had like billions of <laughs> billions of streams on Spotify, and the the royalties were like forty thousand or something, really <laughs> really low. And it's like, dude, it's true. It's like that's that's fucked up, you know. But and trickling down to the indie artists it's like it's it's even it's so so bad but hey you know like there's other ways we can monetize our music we can have our online store we can sell our merch shows like you just have to get creative you know and do yeah. the best you can to <clears throat> to monetize off of it but it's hard man you know yeah it's not easy what are you gonna do it's the way of the world i, I think i think over the years though they'll, they'll I, th I think it, it i think it's still fairly new in terms of them figuring out and you've got lobbies and the record companies are obviously lobbying for certain things and, yeah. you know, performing, right, performing rights organizations are lobbying for different things. And so I think, you know, it, it'll change over the years. Hopefully it'll get a bit better, but is what it is. Yeah, man. So, uh, the theme question of the podcast is what was one of the darkest periods in your career and what did you do to overcome that? Hmm. Well, I'd say there's been a couple of dark periods. Um, one was obviously when we got dropped. Um, because I, I, at that same time, like I was engaged, not to my wife now, but at, you know, this was a while back. Um, and so, you know, I had this expectation that like, all right, we're getting ready to go. Second album, like that, you know, and then that happens. And then the engagement falls through and just like a bunch of stuff happened at the same time. Um, and sort of, I was left and the, and you know, everybody that was sort of in my team management, all that kind of stuff kind of just watched me wallow. <laughs> mm. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it was kind of just like, well, that's what happened. And you gave it your best shot kid, you know, good Ugh. luck with life kind of thing. Wow. So, it, you know, and I don't have any hard feelings about it at this point, but you know, that was a pretty dark time, but also like now feels kind of dark. Um, because I feel like I am starting all over again and I'm totally by myself. So, you know, trying to figure out like, all right, what am I doing? And like, and, you know, I've been looking for musicians and things to, to play with and to make it happen and stuff. And it's just, it's really, it's, it's hard and it's harder as you get older too. You know I mean? I don't, oh, yeah. I don't have the benefit of novelty anymore. I'm no longer the new artist, you know, I've been around for a little while. It isn't that, and it's hard to, I think it changes for, you know, it's different for everyone, but so when that when that finally hits you, it it, it hits hard because you're like, oh fuck, like I'm old, you know, I'm <laughs> fucking old now in the industry because it's yeah. like a, the it, it, the industry is for you know for for the young, right? Like when you're if you want all that attention, if you want to be like become you know a product or become like the next big thing or, or have any chance, you know what I mean? Everyone's yeah. like the A and Rs are they they'll they're more interested in the twenty five year olds than the thirty five year olds or the forty five year olds, yeah. right? So and, it's well, like, it's like, it, it's part of its American culture. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, nothing's all good and all bad, but 
the the good you know there's a good part of american culture that's into what's the next thing what's the new thing you know that it helps us when we're trying to get new technologies and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff but when it comes to entertainment it basically you know makes the person that's not brand new not interesting anymore no. yeah. and so it's a it's a cultural thing that america is very into what what's the new thing and so if you're not the new thing anymore you're not not on anybody's radar I know, for, right? for the most part in terms of yeah. getting like you know that there is something that comes with novelty that and then an excitement that is a discovery part that's like right. oh what's this new thing um and so when you don't have that it's you know it's a bit tougher but at the same time i do think there's value in and people see value in someone who is has shown consistency throughout their career and someone yeah. who has shown seeing your career and the, all the records you put out and all the you know the music you've done and the tours you've done and you know you've shown uh, consistency um even though you know you you've been waiting a little bit to put out this new music but you know i, th- I think people value that as well and then it's there's exceptions you know right like it doesn't mean just because you're you know people that are you know in midlife or it doesn't mean you can't be very successful like in an older age you know what i mean there's yeah. exceptions to everything so it, it, but i do feel like yeah, I, I feel that too. Like once I hit like 35, I started to feel that. I was like, Ooh. you know, it, it's it's kind of, it's it kind of, it stings. But then like yeah. you just get over it. If you love music, it's not going to stop you, you know? Right, yeah. Well, like, like I was saying before, there's no one way. So there's nothing saying that something can happen at yeah. a later time because it's happened before. You know, look at Tina Turner or somebody like that, you know, um, even though she was successful late you know early when she was younger but she yeah. had a whole new career when she was older um so it can happen but at the same time you kind of just have to not give a shit i mean like who cares just do what you like to do um yeah but yeah so i don't know if i answered your question but no, yeah. those were those were those were two dark dark times sort of now and, and then but um in terms of what i what i did to get through it i think i think there's a few things that we all do to sort of get through dark times. Um, for me, one is my, my Christian faith. I think um, I have a sort of a peace of mind, or I believe in providence, you know, um, divine providence and things like that. And I think we always sort of think we know what we want, but we don't really know what we want. Um, you know, it's it's like... If I, for me, I would like to hit every green light going down the road, you know, kind of thing. But I've hit a lot of red lights, right? And I could just get angry and be like, oh, I shouldn't be hitting these red lights. You know, it's ruining my my drive. You know, it's ruining my mm-hmm. good time. But, you know, that those red lights could have prevent, prevented me from getting in an accident three lights down, you know. Um, and so I think my faith... My religious faith is part of that where I go, okay, I'm, I'm where I'm meant to be. And if something's meant to happen for me down the road, then great. It doesn't mean I stop trying or, you know, because I have my passions and, I, and, you know, I love music and I love doing it. But I have to sort of trust that I'm where I'm supposed to be um, for whatever reasons that are beyond my knowledge or understanding. Um, but I think also having just a sense of gratitude always. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, you may not have this, this or that, or whatever it is that's making you feel dark at, at any moment. Um, you have to still be able to look at what you do have, you know, and I think you, you can wallow in self pity for a day or two, but at, after that you got to go, okay, well, you know what? I, I can walk, I can breathe. I can put food on the table. I got a roof over my head. You know, it's not so bad, you know. So I think yeah. you have to have a sense of counting all, all your blessings, like from the smallest ones to the biggest ones. Um, that and staying busy. That's think, a good one. You know, I think you got to just stay. If you if you're sitting and you're sort of just thinking about how dark it is for yourself, it's not not the best use of your time. Well, then it will be dark, you know. Yeah. Like a, you know, it's kind of like. What, what Tony Robbins says, I don't know if you follow him at all, but like he, he talks a lot about like, well, the negative is always available, but so is the positive. It just depends yeah. on what you focus on. So 
just focus on what you're grateful for. Focus on the positive in your life, right. and then that's what your life will be. Yeah, yeah, whatever sort of... Yeah, there's always things to be upset about. There's always negativity yeah. that's going to be there. So, But there's always a positive, so you might as well just... Like you said, focus on, be grateful for what you do have, for the great things that have worked out. Because yeah. I'm sure when you were young, you never thought you'd be playing these awesome tours and making all these records and doing these like fan, you know, awesome things. Like you know, same same thing for me. Like when I was younger, I never thought I I never thought I'd be do I would do some of the things I've already done. But then once you get there, you're like, well, what's next? Like you're always looking for the next thing. It's like what is so. that the law of diminishing return or something? Where it's like everything that's the, you, once when it happens at first, you're like, "Oh, this is great," and then when it becomes normal, you're like, "Yeah, exactly." It doesn't have the same excitement anymore. Right. But the fact of the matter is, you know, you're, you're you're doing really well. You know, you've got you're making a living. You know, engineering, mixing, you know, working with music, and that's pretty cool. That's that's more than you know what most people that start in music they never get to that point. You know, it's true, and yeah, thank you for saying that, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. You know, and we, you know. You know, I've really, like I've told you before, like I've, I've been following your career since, you know, pretty much the beginning with Dalman and, you know, you've done a lot of great things, made so much great music and, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of your music, man. Just so you know that, like truly, Thank I, you. I love all the, the, the way you write, like your voice, the arrangements, like the, your choice of tones. Like I hear, I can, I hear all of that and I hear how, how specific it is and how, you know, passionate you are about it reaching that sound and I, I I don't it's just because that's what I do like I I'm very analytical about music um most of the time because that's I you know day to day I I see things and I um I hear things in an analytical way and then also in a creative way but I notice that in what you're doing so uh well, that's just nice. so you, it's nice that someone notices <laughs> dude yeah and you know I appreciate that and I appreciate your your time like how much time and in, in what you've dedicated to put your vision out there in the way you want it. And like, you're, you, you know, you're, you're patient about it. And I think some people are, some people get very impatient. They're like, well, why hasn't this happened yet? Like, why doesn't my record sound how I, how I want it to sound? Why haven't I played this tour yet? Why haven't I? And it's like, well, there's a lot of people that they, they want all these things, but they're not willing to put in the time Yeah, and they're not, they don't realize like good things take time. It's not like a overnight thing. You know, it's a so, tough balance yeah. because I, I have that same frustration. Like I wish, but the thing is, is like, I'm doing it by myself and like, I'm not, I still consider myself very much a novice in terms of like, even though I've recorded stuff, I'm very much a novice in terms of recording, mixing, all that kind of stuff. There's, I've sort of just been self-taught. I don't know anything, you know what I mean? Like, and so I get it to the point to where I'm happy enough because I'll never be 100% happy because I know I'll, I just I won't ever get there. So I have to just be happy enough to go like, okay, it's good enough to where like I'm not going to want to pull it down next week kind of thing. Well, you, you, you know that that's what 99.9% .9 of what all the greats think too. It's like these people that we look up to, you know, producers, musicians, like – they are equally as hard on themselves and they never, they always feel like, oh, it could be better. It could be better. Like maybe I should do more. Or it's like they're, a lot of the time they're just, they abandon the idea because it's like how much more, you could work on it forever. So, yeah. but no, I, I, I totally relate there because like I'm very, I, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist, but I, I struggle with that. Like, uh, oh, it could be better. Like I just abandon things because it's like, well, that's the best I can do right now at this point in my life maybe next next year i'll spend more time on these certain things but yeah man i, I totally relate with you there it's sure. frustrating because like i'll you know there'll be a guitar tone or like i'll be listening just to the snare or something and be like mm. it's not quite what <laughs> i want snare. it it's always a snare. And it's you know it's not <laughs> where i need it to be but yeah. but i also like i want there's something about i don't know if it's a songwriter thing or whatever it is but like it, it's got to go out like it's so it's almost like a sick feeling in your stomach and you just have to like throw up, you know, right. something like that. Where right. You just feel like you have to put the music out because right. if it's not out, it sort of doesn't exist. If it's a voice note on my phone or an idea in my head, like it's not, it's, it doesn't exist. Like it's there, but it's just, it doesn't really exist until it's out there. And so like, you know, I'll get it as good as I can, but at some point I just got to be like, all right, 
Let it go. Right. Letting it go. That's, that's, I think that's what is the most important thing is, yeah, you're never going to be a hundred percent happy no matter what, you know, even everyone, like all these great artists that we look up to and they're never a hundred percent happy with the record. Like there's always going to be one band member that's like, Oh, that I hate my, yeah. my drum this or the bass player's like, Oh, there's not a bass. It's never like everyone isn't a hundred percent ever. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's always something. So just being able to, to let it go and then you can move on because I think as yeah. we, we keep it bottled up for so long mm-hmm. and that's why a lot of artists, they just write songs and they record them, but then they never finish them. And at some point they come back to it. They're like, Oh, let's remix this and, and get it out. Um, because it's, it just feels like, yeah, like you're, it's in, it's in limbo. That song is like, Oh, what's it? Am I going to trash it or put it out? But most of the time we want to put them out. So yeah. I hate trashing yeah. songs. Yeah. Same, <laughs> same. Um, but yeah, man, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing and all that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So yeah, before we before we wrap it up, is there anything you want to anything you want to announce or anything you want to plug um, for you know the listeners and for your fans to look out for this year? Um, just the new record, yeah. Um, I'm excited about it. Like I said, it's gonna have those five songs that are already out are gonna be on it. Um, but I've I've tweaked them and there's new drums on them and and that kind of thing. Plus ten new tracks, um, so it'll be a fifteen song album. It might be more if I had an interlude or something here and there, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get it out this year. And if I'll, I'm, I'm going to shoot for fall. Um, I wanted to shoot for March, but that just seems increasingly unrealistic. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to try for Mar- or for for fall. And uh, yeah, so that's that's really the only thing to watch out for. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm terrible on social media, so you know I I try to post now and then um, just to let people know I'm still here. Um, cause we have an attention economy now, yep. you know, so <laughs> apparently if you don't post all the time, people don't know you exist. I don't believe right. that, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, I'll try to, um, hopefully we'll be a b- bit more active this year just because I've got something to show for it. Whereas before I was in a limbo and trying to just figure things out. And now that I sort of have a clear vision and, and part of that vision happened because, you know, I'm alone now. And now that I know sort of what everything's going to be and, and how I'm putting basically everything under the domino umbrella stuff that was under solo projects and stuff. Um, yeah. So now that, now that I have a clear vision, hopefully, um, fans and and people that are interested, will be hearing a little bit more from me this year, this year, next year, hopefully. Yeah. I have a feeling a lot of people are just kind of hanging out waiting for new domino music because it did seem like, at least to me, it seemed like you guys had like this, this cult following, like very, diehard fans um that was from my perspective though but you know I mean, yeah, no, yeah. it's it's still there and i still get you know messages now and then and i think yeah i think people are waiting i think people are always waiting for tours um mm. and i can't i don't know what to say about that yet i mean like like i said i hope hopefully i can make something happen but i have to find the right people um but at least there will be music and like you're right there's definitely a core audience and they're all you know 15 years older now <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and they have, you know, lots of people who are, who are, you know, young and going to shows and stuff are now, you know, married with children. So, but they, but they still, um, they still tune in, which is good. You know, I, I see the stats on Spotify and Apple Music and it's cool to see that people are still spinning the music. So, yeah, that's the best feeling, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's, it's that it is the best feeling to know that, you know, you're, I think that's one of the things that's sort of addictive about doing music is you have this effect on people that you don't know exactly you know and it's there's there's some there's some like positive reinforcement that happens with that where you go like i like that i like knowing that i did something that did some amount of good or that just made somebody just enjoy their day a little bit more for five minutes because that tune is on and they're like nodding their head to it there's something about that 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 really, um, I think, contributes to me wanting to continue. If everybody's just like, oh, this shit sucks, you know, <laughs> I, w- I probably wouldn't be. I would be like, yeah, yeah, you're probably right, and I will stop. But uh, the fact that people, you know, do love it and they tell me now and then, I think that's, it definitely helps, you know, because there's, there's times when I'll get down. I'll just be like, what am I doing? Who cares? Nobody cares. Nobody cares about what I'm doing, you know, and then every once in a while I'll get this little email that's going like, I was listening to your song today and I'm like, okay, 
yeah. right, let me go back yeah. in the studio. Yeah. You know, those messages, they, they mean a lot because it just, yeah, it lets me know that somebody cares. Well, I know for a fact a lot of people care, um, and I'm one of them. So thank you for your music over the years. Uh, they've, you know, it, I've gone through phases of listening listening to different types of music, but, you know, your mu- music has always been solid, and uh, it's always something that when I go back to, I'm like, yeah, it's still it. I still got it. Still, Thanks, still man. love it. So We'll have to do yeah. another show together. Well, that, we got we gotta do we gotta we gotta do something together in the future. So maybe we could maybe we could do, work on some music together. But uh, awesome. but dude, thank you so much for coming by. Like I'm, yeah. I'm so grateful that you decided to take the time and have a chat. And like I said, uh, appreciate you being patient with me. I know it's yeah, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.